Alô. Funciona. E aí, galera, beleza? Vocês sabem que o meu trabalho aqui é gritar, né? Tá certo? Então, eu vou avisar para vocês que estão aqui na frente que eu vou gritar. Vai sair dessa caixa aqui. Ok? Beleza? E eu estou experimentando também assim, o som aqui, né? Porque eu não sei se, é, se o som é bom. Então, a gente tem que fazer bacana, é isso? Então, vamos lá. Não está avisado aí, não está? Ok? Boa tarde, Campos Party! Oh! Oh! É isso aí, galera! E estamos em mais uma Campus Party. Já estão curtindo ou não? A galera já está todo mundo aqui, tá certo? Quem aqui está aqui na frente quer implantar um chip? Ninguém quer implantar o chip, você está falando que é aqui na apresentação, pô. Né? O cara que quer implantar o chip, é isso? Vamos lá. Para que é que você quer implantar um chip? Faço a menor ideia. É seu espírito. Tá certo? O importante é ter o chip. Agora, onde você quer implantar o chip? Na mão. Na mão? Tá bom, né? Tá certo? Né? Melhor, melhor seguir quem já está fazendo, não é isso? Agora, você acha que ele implantou o chip na mão por quê? Não sei. Por isso você veio assistir, não é isso? Então, beleza. É isso aí, galera. Quem mais quer implantar chip aqui? Ninguém mais quer implantar chip? Só ele aqui? Aqui, ó, tem um cara que quer implantar chip aqui. Beleza. E aí, você quer implantar o chip pra quê? Pra na hora de passar no, na entrada da Campus Party, não precisar mostrar o crachá, é isso? Não, não, na verdade, eu, eu quero implantar o um chip na mão de outra pessoa pra ver o que que faz. Ah, <risos> tá certo. Esse é o verdadeiro cientista, né? Tá certo? Deixa os outros se ferrarem, é isso? Né? Isso foi muito legal, você vai colocar em você também, não? É isso aí. É isso aí, galera, e tá começando mais uma Campus Party. Primeiro dia, a galera ainda tá meio calma. Quem ficou acordado até de noite aqui ontem? Né? Até tardão. Ela fez uma cara assim, não sei se foi tão tarde assim. Então, até que hora você ficou acordada? Até umas três da manhã. Quem ficou acordado até as três da manhã? Quem ficou mais? Quem ainda não dormiu? O cara lá atrás ainda não dormiu. Não te deram barraca, é isso? Você está acordado direto. Né? É isso aí. Quem está acampando aqui? É, beleza. Muito bom, galera. Nós estamos começando aqui é, a nossa primeira palestra magistral. Olha, o cara é russo. Tem um nome impronunciável. Né? Ele já falou que era impronunciável. Vou tentar aqui. Tá certo? É, mas ele implantou o chip pra, né, como um projeto pessoal suportado pela empresa, mas implantou o chip que é para poder começar a estudar como é que a gente pode fazer biotecnologia, como é que a gente pode né, é, ter, de fato, computadores implantados na gente, para que, que serve, tá certo? Né? Ao contrário do nosso amigo cientista ali, ele fez nele mesmo para descobrir como é que é. E uma das grandes questões é o seguinte, é a segurança, né? Na hora que você implanta o chip, o que o cara vai fazer? Vai cortar a tua mão fora, é isso? Né? Hoje em dia o cara rouba o teu cartão de crédito, mas se você colocar na mão, né? Então a gente tem que pensar em tudo isso, tá certo? Então, sem mais delongas, vou chamar com vocês aqui, Ivni Che! E só um detalhezinho, ele vai falar em inglês, tá certo? É, o pessoal que ainda não pegou o radinho, tem que pegar o radinho para poder ouvir, ok? Thank you. Ok. Uh, bom dia, Campus Party. Yeah, yeah. How you feeling? Good. I gotta say, as a gamer, it really warms my heart because I don't think I have ever seen that many people playing World of Warcraft and Heroes of the Storm in one place. Never. <laughs> and to be honest, I still want to join. 
Uh, but I have to give you a presentation. Maybe after, we're going to play some games. So those of you who already know me, so basically you read the blog, or by other means, you already are aware by now that impossible is just a word, basically a word that has no meaning and never stops a true visionary. If you want to imagine something and achieve something, you can do it. And me being here is the proof of that. Because if you want to be a cyborg, it turns out you can. For those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. Uh, as I was told, I'm a Russian with an unpronounceable name, which is <laughs> kind of true. But uh, I'm so-called professional cyborg. Professional means I'm the, the only guy on the planet right now who is not doing it for fun. I'm doing it specifically for the sake of high-tech uh, research. Because eventually, we are moving to a new era. And what scares me as a person is like not a lot of companies or people understand what really is happening with the Internet of Things uh, type of thing. By the way, on the, on the left, it's my real uh, x-ray of my real left hand. So the chip, for those you are asking, it's, it's here. And I don't feel it. So um, does it work? No. I can, <laughs> I can change the slide. We're going to, OK. So this is, uh, this is what it looks like. The biochip is very small. It's 2 by 12 millimeters. And it's covered by bioglass. Bioglass means that it's hyperallergic. So the body, the human body, doesn't reject the chip. Because usually our body rejects pretty much everything that is unnatural. Uh, inside, there is a small chip. There is a small antenna. And there is approximately one kilobyte, kilobyte of storage that you can do whatever the hell you want with. And using this chip, I actually can interact with a lot of things around us. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are asking and wondering how did it go and how do you implant yourself, it's not that hard. So on uh, your right, it's basically day one. So we have a choice uh, to go with a professional doctor or do it with the master of, ma master of piercing. And it turned out that doctors are paranoid. And they said, no, 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 no. We're going to not do it. You have to have an insurance. You have to wait for half a year before we figure it out. And Master of Piercing said, 50 bucks, and it's going to be two minutes for me. And <laughs> guess, guess what did I choose? Of course, 50 bucks right here, right now. Uh, in three days, basically, it doesn't feel, you don't feel anything. You just play with a lot of smartphones and tablets around you and try to experiment. Uh, which makes a lot of people crazy, I got to say, especially in the underground. Next slide. So a lot of times I've been asked, like, why the hell did you do that, man? Like, what's the point of having a chip? Is that different from a wearable, from a bracelet? You can, you can have a bracelet and open whatever you want to open. Why? Why? And I got to say that there is uh, not just one reason, but many reasons why uh, I implanted the chip. As I told you, mostly for experimentation. Uh, next. So the primary reason I did it is to basically make the market, so the companies and you guys, rethink what is the Internet of Things. Because everybody says Internet of Things and uh, talks about connected cars and et cetera. But to be honest, and I, I, work, for, I work for a world, uh, worldly uh, known company. I travel a lot. And I know literally like 10 people on the planet who know what Internet of Things really is. Like, technological, from technological perspective, from uh, the point of view of data, legal, etc. And maybe most of them are in this room, by the way. Uh, most of the people, they have no idea. But um, this is how we picture it usually. So we picture that we manage stuff. So we have connected cars. We manage the cars. We have a refrigerator that can buy uh, groceries for us. We control the fridge. We can control the temperature in the room, blah, 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 blah. We control everything. Well, in reality, what I've learned living a year with a chip, it's a bit different. Uh, the situation is a bit different because it's not like Internet of Things exists and a human exists. You're becoming part of it. So when you have a chip inside, you kind of, in a way, you're becoming a thing. And I felt it, like really, like you feel that you're a thing because you touch something and it responds. 
Like you're touching the lock, it opens. You're touching a car, it starts. And it's, it's a very weird feeling. Uh, in a good way and in a bad way. Uh, next one. So before I get to the hardcore stuff, let me just you know, move you to it in an organic way. So the benefits of the Internet of Things and people living with the chips, they're pretty promising. So you can open all type of locks. You can forget about keys. You can get rid of the password because you can just touch uh, the screen and Facebook would let you in. You can basically uh, start a connected car. A lot of things, actually. Like medicine would be way, way more uh, precise because you can control the medicine from the point it is manufactured somewhere to the point where a person literally took a pill in whatever this person actually had the prescription for this pill. So it's a lot of things. Uh, some of the things that can be done, I want to show you today. So this is uh, not a video, this is a picture. But uh, I got to say that Kaspersky Lab, the company I'm working for, they were very supportive. So for me to explore the possibilities of the biochip, they replaced all the locks in the company. So I don't have to bear a passport or an ID or a key or a badge. Or, I just go through the office to the gym, to, the, to my office, to the building, to the garage, to the cantina, to the restricted areas like the server room that only a few people can access. And for me, it's like this. I just walk, touch it, and go. And it makes you crazy because uh, some doors are not changed. So very, very rarely, I face what it would be like to be me two years ago. So I come to a door, I touch it, and it doesn't open. And it's like, what the hell is going on with you? Why, why it's not connected? What key? Do I have to bury a key? It's not natural already. This is how it literally looks. The next one. Uh, this one is a video. Uh, I wanted to show you that it's realistic and that you can literally unblock, unblock any mobile device with a chip. Could you play the video, please? Hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to show you how to unblock a smartphone uh, with no password at all, just using the uh, biochip in my left hand. I'm using an app called Tap Unlock here. Um, I'm entering a PIN just in case uh, we have a problem of any kind, so I would be able basically to unblock the phone uh, without any chip. Uh, so I now need to add uh, my ID. So basically, I have to uh, yeah, put it on my hand. Yeah, here it is. It uh, recognizes uh, my chip. So I'm going to call it chip and switch it on. Here it is. So right now, I have to uh, switch off the phone. Uh, on the button is on the back. Yeah. And as soon as I switch on the phone, I'm going to be uh, asked to enter a password or uh, basically do this. Simple. So. This is, this is literally how it works. So everything that you connect, it's like touching and you go. I got to say that some applications, unfortunately, are buggy. So when the application with the identification through the chip crashes, it's kind of pain in the ass, if you know what I mean, because you have to restart it in a developer's mode and bypass it, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, quality of the code of the application became a personal thing. I truly care. And if the application is bad, or well, the user experience is bad, I start to be not just angry as all of you, because you're just angry when it happens. I want to literally strangle the developer who did such bad code, because it affects my life. I open my door in my house or my kids, you know, whatever, room with it, and you are doing the bad code. So I guess lesson number one, we have to, in the era of Internet of Things, we have to write better code. Uh, the second uh, video, you can run it uh, because it's in Russian, so I muted it. It's a very specific illustration of what can be done if you apply your mind to it. Star Wars in the audience, Star Wars fans, anyone? Thank God. I love you people. So we actually decided to play a Jedi trick with a force push, if you know what I mean. So if you combine Microsoft Kinect and some pretty weird engineering that we've done in Russia and the biochip, which actually identifies me. So it, it gives uh, uh, the checkbox that I have the right to open that door. So this is basically me <laughs> in the very fluent Russian 
uh, <laughs> explaining what I'm about to do. And I'm about to open this door, just you know, applying the biochip to the reader. Like, look at it. No, seriously, it just, you just can control it the way you want it. <laughs> so you, you, you see, I have this thing. So I like to think of myself as a Jedi now. <laughs> because I kind of have to prove, uh, prove that it works. <laughs> yeah, so uh, basically as simple as that. But uh, could we have the next one? Yeah. yeah, this one doesn't work. So this is basically a rough summary, rough, very short summary of what can be done. I already touched some of it. But I got to say, for me, it's exciting to understand that everything is possible. You, there are some restrictions. For example, we talked to several banks. And we asked them, guys, we want to make this chip a payment method. So basically, we want you to embed a unique ID and make this chip look as if it was a MasterCard or a Visa card. And actually, it is possible. The problem is, the first question was, do you have encryption in the chip? I said, mm-mm. And he said, we cannot do that. So uh, the problem is, uh, right now, there are several obstacles on the further development. For example, if you want to solve the encryption, and you are gamers, so you know what the heat of a CPU is. So in order to have an encryption, you need a CPU inside, because you need processing power to do the encryption. Uh, when you have processor, you have to problem. You have to cool it, and you have to power it. So you need a battery. And I just thought that I'm not ready to be charged uh, yet. So, uh, but the good thing about this experiment is we started to pay attention to different technology research. For example, energy. Because if you think about it, I'm walking right now, I'm wasting calories. So there is kinetic energy, temperature in my body, and basically I ate a hamburger half 30 minutes ago. I'd love to burn this. <laughs> but right now I have to run. What if we could create a technology that basically convert body energy into electric energy. It would be enough to power the chip with encryption. And by doing so, I could pay for stuff. Or actually store confidential data, like financial data, medical data, and stuff. And here we come to the stuff that I wanted to share with you. OK, if this is also awesome, what's the trick? Because usually there is a trick, as everything is so beautiful, right? So uh, I'm going to tell you about the trick by the show of hands. Who is familiar with the uh, Johari window uh, concept? OK, very few people are. It's magnificent. It's really good to be here, guys. Really, Usually, it's like, what's the next slide? So for those of you who don't know, I have to explain what the Johari window concept is. So it's a psychological concept that explains how we, as human, we develop. How do we educate ourselves? And the concept says that there are only four states of information that exist. The first state is something that I know about myself and you know about myself. So it's something obvious, like I have a beard. I know this, you know this, it's kind of obvious. So the second is, it's in a way a blind spot. So it's something that you know about me, but I don't know about myself. The good example is I'm in the brochure, so I'm in, in the agenda of Campus Party, and you read it, and I didn't. So I have no idea what's inside. So for me, I have no clue. But you have an information that is about me, but I don't know it. The third one is a tricky one. It's something I know about me, but nobody in the room knows about me. I would prefer to keep it this way, but <laughs> just for the sake of illustration, for example, I know I've been divorced two times. 30 seconds ago, you didn't know about it. So it's just something that is mine, purely mine. And the last one is basically when it's a subconscious level. When I don't know something about me. You don't know something about me, but it exists. The good example of something to illustrate you what the fourth window is, it's extreme sports. For example, you don't know if you like parachute jumping unless you jump. When you're jumping, you're like flying for a minute, and you're like, you know, doing your business. You learn a lot about yourself, right? And the information is tricky. The concept of Johari Window says that we as human we go to the next level emotionally, physically, mentally, when we jump from four to one. So basically, we don't know something, and then we learn something, and it's obvious for everyone. Like, I can do parachute jumping. You know that you can trust me with, with this, whatever. And this is the, the scary part. So after living one year with a biochip, I just realized that 
this is how Johari window looks uh, today. So I just realized that I don't know a lot about me that social media uh, search engines, basically the internet wouldn't know about me. They sometimes know more about me that I do, that my relatives do, and my friends do. Because it turns out that Facebook is checked more often than you meet your relatives in some countries. And this is the tricky part. When you live in with biochip, it's different for you in terms of how you think about data. Because when you're at a smartphone, you always, you're kind of used to the fact you click, I agree, and you, OK, this is what I'm going to do. If I don't like the application, I'm going to just reinstall it or use another one. With the chip, you cannot do that. So I started to be paranoid. And let me introduce you to yourself. This is how I look in the eyes of Google. You look in the eyes of Google, social media, all the big data companies. This is you. If they don't see the soul or they don't see the personality, they just know who you are in terms of habits. What do you want to buy? Or what would you potentially would want to buy in a year? And this is kind of scary. They're gathering this information for this sake. This is basically everybody in this room and your relatives and your family. This information is gathered as well. So the connections are kind of another argument to sell you more. And this is, and this is basically how we look if we combine it all together, Internet of Things, us, guy with a biochip, it doesn't matter. We actually generate a huge amount of information. So every time I start a car, I open a door, or you do the same with a smartphone or the key. With the key, not so much. It cannot be tracked, but give it time. We are given a huge amount of uh, precious you know, gold to someone. Uh, let me ask you a question. Who do you think owns this data? I gave it a lot of thoughts about <laughs> play, playing with a chip, and I realized that everybody but us. So the data about me, or it is fair to say that is valid for all of you in this room, the data is owned by everyone but you. Isn't it weird? I was OK with it when I had a smartphone. Now when I have physical ownership of some chip with data, I'm not OK with it. I want to own the data. This is the main idea for you to learn today from me, because I, I learned it in a hard way. So when we at Kaspersky, me and my team, we realized that this is bad. So the data is owned by everybody but me. We had a choice. Forget about it and continue to live our lives. Or as a matrix, I call it a matrix choice, eat the pill and you know wake up. Guess what we decided? So <laughs> we decided to wake up and to go as far as we can to be the visionary, to dig to the end, whatever it takes. And by the way, yeah, this is me. <laughs> Could you? So uh, right now in the company, there are probably dozens dozen of people with a biochip like this. And every day, we are performing a lot of experiments, so-called user scenarios. So what could happen if? What we're going to do if? What we need to research more to achieve A, B, C, D, A, Z? And it's very interesting to uh, understand that the, 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 the nothing, some of you might think that this is a revolution. I thought that myself, day one and day three, and then I realized nothing really changed. We're already sitting like this. I've seen many, you've seen it all, right? There's a beautiful woman and a beautiful man. They're sitting together on a date, and they're like <laughs> talking to each other. And my, my point is, it's not that different. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is true. What is different is that it turns out that we are, in a way, I'm going to use this strong world to, to, to be, I'm kind of afraid to pronounce it out loud, but we are digital slaves, in a way. Because whatever we do, we are basically being used over and over and over. And when I realized this, I have to share, I was drinking for the whole week. Maybe because I'm Russian, but uh, I think that biochip and data had something to do with it. And I have a theory on that. A theory was born. I have to share it with you because maybe it would help you in your work and in your study or whatever you guys do. It feels that internet is copying what real life is. Because in the beginning of times, our grand, 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 grandfathers, even before that on the screen, they were free to do whatever they wanted. You could go outside a cave and kill a person. Or you could go outside the cave and rape someone or steal something. Nobody would say anything because there was no concept of legislation. 
So what's wrong with killing people? They said, go and kill people, people, mammoths, whatever. And it's exactly what internet was like at the beginning of times. You can literally go hack Pentagon, put child pornography online, and nobody would tell you a word. You say, hey, I can do whatever I want. You don't know what, it, what internet is from the legal perspective. But what's happened next uh, 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 is this. This is right now. So right now, I feel that there is Game of Thrones going on. Because uh, what is feudalism, really? It's when monarch has a lot of resources that he owns, people, gold, food, weaponry, everything. And he uses it, guess what, for his own good. So if you're a monarch, if you want to attack France, I'm sorry for the, all the French people in the room, by the way, just for the sake of illustration. If you want to attack France, you just go and attack France. Because you like their vineyards just because of that you want to. And this is, I feel, what's going on right now. Because the big data companies, they are owning and gathering this data, which is a true value. Money for them is not a value. For them, data is value. They feed on it. And they actually use it, <laughs> to be honest, for their own good. They use it, our data, to sell us more, in a way. Or make their services better. Yes, it is true. But anyway, they're using it for their good, not for mine or yours or whatever. And I have a dream. That's why I'm here, that we together can change this for sure and for real. Because what happened in the real world, there was a concept of freedom of personality and human rights born. Uh, basically, it happened when the North America got independent from the UK and they sank their fleet uh, in, Boston, in Boston Harbor. And I believe that this is something that is organic for nature, because it turns out that it's more profitable for nature to have several millions of people who are free and they own something and they protect it and they enrich it and they give it to their kids, etc. They develop it. Then to have one more doing the same for himself. And I believe that we as people, we can totally do the same with the internet in the next three, five, ten years, I don't know. We can total, totally uh, create the concept of private property for data when actually we, whatever it's a chip, whatever it's an app, whatever it's a device, we start to own the data that we produce, where we go, what we read, what we search, our medical exams, like my blood type or whatever. Thank you, I love you too. <laughs> so uh, whatever, whatever you have as data every day, you have to keep it, encrypt it, and basically have a control button. I want to destroy it. I, I, haven't, I don't have to ask Google's permission for that. I just destroy it. I'm going to give it to my kids, even my naked pictures, which I don't want to. But I, I, if I want to, I have to have a tool to do that, right? And my point is, this is why I'm here. That's why the company is not keeping this a secret. We want to bring you on board, get your questions, get your concerns. And we want to make this digital freedom concept a public activity. So nobody, not a single company, could actually own it. Because I believe strongly that we, as people, we have to take care of each other. Not the companies, not, not anybody big would, would do that. Only we can take care of each other. And I think that the biochip learned me, like taught me to think like that. And I'm pretty darn serious about it. I hope you are too, because it's a one-way ticket. You have to commit, and there is no try. You have to just do or do not. And uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and uh, welcome to the Freedom Team, hopefully. <laughs> and you guys, uh, if you have any questions, I, I think we have a time for Q&A. So just a sec, I have to, I don't speak Portuguese, unfortunately. I know. <laughs> we need microphones for the... There is a lady with a microphone, so let's wait for her. And by the way, ask whatever you want. I'm going to be honest, I promise. Oh. So this is how I sound in Portuguese? OK. <laughs> yeah. And those guys are doing an amazing job. So where is the OK, microphones are here. Hello. So the 
Do your chips have like a safety system, like someone could cut your hands apart and go to your company? This is one of the most <laughs> popular questions I get. What would happen if we cut your hand off? Let me, uh, <laughs> let me tell you one thing. If someone is cutting my hand, this is, the biochip is the last thing I'm going to bother about. <laughs> so, so, technically, technically, it's valid for everyone. It's like, if someone is killing me, would you reveal the secret? Or well, your password to Facebook? I guess you would, because this is the last thing you would protect. Uh, theoretically, but seriously speaking, uh, right now, uh, the technology itself is safe and not safe at the same time. The safe part to your question, you have physically to do two things. You have to know where it is. So you have to know that my chip is here. Uh, and you have to basically touch me physically, because the, uh, the antenna is really small. So that's why I have to touch the door to open. Right now, it's not wireless. And I think it's, pr it's pretty much the same level of um, protection you get, get with the wallet. Because you have your wallet uh, on you, and if someone is still in you, still in the wallet, you actually feel that someone is touching you. You said, man, what are you doing? Like, stop doing that. Uh, it's my wallet, and it's my ass. Don't, uh, whatever. So, but the problem is, let's say I'm unconscious. I'm sleeping on the plane. Right now, you can, if you know, you can touch and download everything. So, and that's the, the, the good thing about this experiment, because I'm here and I'm committed to this, to change the situation. Because I want to create the situation where even if you take my arm, you won't read the information, because it's going to be encrypted and, for example, use a lot of biometric data to identify me. So for example, my voice. My voice is unique. If I'm not speaking to the chip, the information is encrypted. You can, there are many ways to do that. So it's a very good question. Right now, not safe going to be safe, I promise. Mm. So this is the point. Anyone else? Who? it's hot in here. <laughs> it's minus 20 back home. Hello. Uh, uh, did you buy the biochip or did you make it by yourself? I bought it. Again, very good question. Right now, you can... NFC slash RFID technology is not revolutionary. So it's not created yesterday. Uh, for approximately 50 years, similar, not this chip, but similar chips were used to track uh, the migration of birds on the planet. So my point is, the chip you can buy today, it's approximately $100. Uh, if you Google or come to my blog, which I think it's easy to find, you can literally click and buy with a delivery, uh, this chip. But I think if you're asking me, do not buy this one because the next upgrade <laughs> is very close. So, because, and if, it's, it, if you want to replace, you want to take the chip and replace a new one, it's kind of painful. So let's wait, wait, do not, do not hurry up. There was a question here. Does the, does the ship need and thank you for the questions. The questions are very interesting. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Uh, thanks for, uh, for being here. I would like to know about you how you can guarantee that the chip will not be another kind of control by the government? Very good question. So I have a news for you. Who has smartphones right now? The government needs just that. <laughs> because when you have a smartphone, the smartphone actually is not it doesn't exist in the void. It connects to base stations, to the Wi-Fi, to Bluetooth, and it has a unique signature. So the government already, if they want to, or in some countries, they kind of need a permission for that. So <laughs> they can track everything. They can know what you talked about, whom do you talk to, when, wh how did you move, uh, everything. They don't need a chip for that. So I wouldn't, this is the last concern of mine. But uh, I once was asked by a, a girl, I think it was in Germany. Well, you're going to understand why it's Germany. So it's per, per, right, right type of paranoia. I said, what if the government would want to control your thoughts with a chip? I was like, I have to touch the door, woman, to uncle. The thoughts are so, so far away. So no, you cannot, so you understand, if, you, if, if, if this information bothering you, it's not possible, because in order to get in here, uh, you have to somehow connect to the neural system, and what is more important, manage to decrypt the brain, which is not, um, not possible. I don't, uh, can you? Microphone, I can. Does the, does the ship require some kind of, some kind of maintenance? So, sorry, why? 
Does the, sh does the ship require some kind of maintenance? Maintenance? Um, I sometimes talk to it. <laughs> no. So the chip itself uh, has the potential of being rewritten 100,000 times. And it's pretty self-sufficient. So I've been with this for the year. Never, never did anything. Ah, by the way, uh, before you ask, in the airports, nothing happens. It's not detected. Hi. Um, are there any prospects of it um, in regards um, to biomedicine and stuff like that? And also, um, um, any prospects for it to become mainstream? And if so, when? I can see a Deus Ex player from long, long distance. So uh, biomechanics, yes. Uh, well, bio, how, do you call, how did you call it? Biomedicine? I think yes, because um, let me paraphrase. The biomedicine is a separate technology. So we already have a lot of people out there with bionic arms, bionic legs. We already have that. What chip can help with is to probably uh, store the information and make those implants better. So basically, more functioning, uh, more complex, more stable, because you can basically adjust it on the go according to your personal behavior. I believe that, to be honest, in the future that uh, there is a potential of a technology like that to be stored in your personal information. Because right now, I'm comfortable with this being just the key to the cloud storage. But theoretically, a human cell stores a huge amount of information, potentially. So you can grow a storage here or somewhere you want. So there is a huge potential to that. In terms of mainstream, I strongly believe that people are lazy by design. And I met with some uh, really cool journalists today. And most of them asked this question, what is the mainstream story? And I think that if you understand that we are lazy, you can understand that it's going to be very soon. I, I'm thinking uh, there would be two stages. The first stage is when it's very cheap and it's compatible to something big like underground tickets, subway tickets or you know, some tickets. So basically, you go to subway, you just touch it, and you go. A lot of people would go with that if it's like very cheap. But the major like, spike would uh, get there when there would be encryption embedded. And when it's happening, it's going to be finally secure. And it means that people, every person in the, on the planet would have a choice. I either carry my passport, uh, driving license, medical insurance, all discount cards, uh, whatever documents I have, everything, the keys from my door, garage, from my office, with me. Or I suffer for 30 seconds, maybe one minute, and I get rid of it for the rest of my life. And everything I do is just touching, and I control it from the app. I feel that this is the true potential to happen within the next five years. It's not that far. Because the encryption is known. The only concern right now is energy. So how do you power up this so you can have encryption and CPU in it? I think it's going to be solved pretty soon. So within five years, watch the news. There could be major spikes of interest. But I promise from my side, so I'm, I'm having a blog, and I try to be as transparent as possible. So uh, the more questions you, you ask like this, the more efficient the result would be. I want, it, I, want, I want it to be, as I told you, absolutely open to people. So you understand what is the technology, what does it do, what are the concerns, what does it not do, and make an informed decision like, I don't want to ever have a chip, or my kid would never have a chip. Or you say, you know what, I'm going to. But it's an informed decision. You are free to choose. And right now, what I feel like it's happening, sometimes we are not being told the truth about technology. I want this to be a different case. Hey, Joe. Um, well, first, here. Where? <laughs> right. Uh, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, thanks for the amazing talk. And I wish to ask you, with the Internet of Things coming closer and closer every year of past, um, and the maker community growing so fast and having Which upgrade. community? Which community? Huh? Which community? Internet of Things, maker. Ah, makers, makers, makers. Yeah. And we have two sections that mess with the same things you did, uh, that Bioware and Biopunk. Uh -huh. What is your view about these people making the eye, forehead, and this kind of thing? <clears throat> Body you, modifications. You want an honest answer? Yeah. I don't want to be uh, disrespectful at any point. I think 
everything that is a science, so it's a science research, I applaud it. So people are trying to push the edge and learn new things for humanity. Because some people, for example, they suffer an incident and a bionic eye could be the only way to see. In this particular case, I think they're doing a great job. But my personal attitude, if you think about it, uh, I'm a big fan of science fiction and cyberpunk, and I'm, I'm feeling comfortable with that here with you. So I feel that uh, it's not the primarily focus. We shouldn't be focusing on new implants or new eyes and new ears that much as we should be focusing on how do we deal with the information itself. Because eventually, let's say someone finds out a way to have an augmented brain part, and you can store it. This is what they're doing. I or this, it's pretty much the same. Complexity is different, yeah. But let's say you can store something. I have a problem with that. Because eventually, when, when someone has access, I have no privacy at all. They know everything in there. And it's OK if they are the only people who have access. The hackers, they are pretty smart busters nowadays. They can, everybody can be hacked. And I think that this is the, to your question, what is missing in the YUT community, and I've seen it many times with big companies, with small companies, they, they do not put security and privacy of a human being in the center. It's usually either technological path or business path. So either we are doing really high tech stuff or we're making money here. And I think, I'm absolutely sure it should start, okay, before we go any further, how do we protect the private memories of this person? If we're making an eye, would someone be able to download uh, the, what he sees on the go? We are making a new whatever. Can we protect this? Can it be sniffed, hacked, intercepted, etc.? So I, th I guess uh, I would recommend to people to see more science fiction movies. It helps to see the paranoia and how scary it could be. And by the way, to all of you, uh, those of you who haven't seen the series called Mr. Robot, highly recommend to see everything. And I work for the security company. Everything is real. Like, nothing is made up there. We checked. <laughs> we checked everything is real. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have more questions there? Over here. Over here. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, in your presentation, you say something about medicine. It could be used for, I don't know, maybe uh, <laughs> for uh, getting to know if something's wrong with our body. Uh, how would it be, uh, how will it be, be developed? I don't know how it's going to be developed, to, to be honest, because I'm not in the medicine, uh, but I can tell you how, what I think. So in medical perspective, I see basically several different tracks. The first one, uh, the chip could be developed as a unified lifetime storage for your medical data. So because right now, when you go to a doctor, usually they force you to, well, they have to, to f make you go through some exams. So go and do an x-ray. Go and do a uh, ultrasound. Go and give our blood samples. We don't know your blood type. So if you have this in here, you can always go touch their computer and say, you have all my story. What do you need? And it would already be way more uh, precise because they would know the whole history and they would know how the, the potential illness developed. The second is a pharmaceutical one, because eventually there are people sometimes who are taking wrong medicine. So because of the mistake of a doctor or for other reason, or they're drug addicts, they're just taking the medicine that is not suited for them. And uh, one, of the uh, uh, one of the development uh, tracks could be that the chip could know, basically, before taking the medicine, you register it. And basically, the doctor, the the, the, the doctor would know if you're taking it in time, if you're taking the right medicine, and if you're like playing with it. And the third one, uh, well, it's technically 50 years from now. It's already like you know real-time communication with the medical facilities, augmented like body parts, etc. I think it's a century far away, to be honest. But thank you for the question. Very good question. There's a Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you for because I can cannot see you uh, literally. So, mm -hmm. hi. Hi. <laughs> and when you get the, the, the biochip, do you regret in some level? 
regret. Uh, and I have a second question. Do you think it will be a thing in the future, like everybody will have it like a smartphone? Or it will be more, not so much a thing like that? Uh, great questions. No, I don't regret it. I did regret for the first day. I was like, shit. <laughs> Why did I do it? Uh, but then I have to say no, because it completely changed the way I treat privacy and personal data management. And this concept of digital freedom, it wouldn't have been born if I wouldn't have in, would be having the chip. And uh, the second question, smartphones or not, uh, again, if you ask me, I think that smartphones would die. Because eventually, it's a brick. I, I'm a big fan of Steve Jobs. I believe that many of you are. Uh, so while Steve was alive, every time we were hoping for something absolutely amazing and new. And it's kind of not happening right now. We, we are having bricks, bricks, and bricks manufactured by different companies. I believe that, well, anyway, it's a pretty ambitious, but I would try to continue what Steve Jobs was doing. So I'm thinking that you don't need a brick to solve your problem as a consumer, to call your friends or to post on Facebook or to check your emails or to check in in a place. You, need, you can have a different type of device. I'm not saying a chip, but let's consider for a minute that you have uh, a very smart uh, boots. You're wearing boots every day, right? And you can actually, theoretically, charge them by walking, right? So it's a perpetual, it's an eternal uh, engine. So just imagine for a second that your smartphone is, is the boots. So you're walking, it's hardware, uh, processor, cooling, everything is in there. And if, when you want to call someone, you just touch your watch and you call because you just connected, but the hardware is there. Here is the uh, remote, and you can have a uh, hearing plug a, and a microphone here because you need to talk. And it just is just one of the vectors I'm thinking about. So. This is, again, my opinion. I think they're going to die. <laughs> the sooner the better. <laughs> there are so many, so many technologies to explore, and we are stuck with a brick. It's two questions. The first one is, if the main use of the chip is to use as authentication method, why not use biometrics? That it's a lot easier. Fantastic question. So uh, when you're using a password online, and the password gets stolen, what do you do? You go and you restore the password. When someone steals your fingerprint, you have 10 times in your lifetime to change your biometric. And I think that the perception is wrong. Biometric is a bad, it's a, it's a good factor of authentication as an like additional one, not the primarily one, because it can be stolen. Because the computer, you have to understand how computer thinks. It doesn't see your face or your fingerprint. It sees some picture, well, sometimes multi-layer picture, and it transforms it it's into the zeros and ones. It's as simple as that. Every fingerprint is a set of zeros and ones. So if I'm a hacker, and you identify it using biometrics to your computer, and this is the only identification you have, I can get in the between, steal this ID, and I can be you for the rest of my life. Because this is your fingerprint. It won't change. It's just the same through your life. And this is the answer. So fingerprint and biometrics, it's not the solution. It's just one factor. That's why I'm thinking, and the chip is not the solution. Chip is, it could be the primarily one, but you have to have voice, fingerprint, retina. You have to have DNA, potentially. Many things that uh, can be developed. OK? So don't, don't think that if you have fingerprint, it's just safe. No, it's not. The second, question, the second question is, the services that we use by big companies like Google and Facebook that are paid by advertisement from this big data that they collect, yep. if they do not collect this data, how will the services be free? And we are not forced to, do, to subscribe to Facebook, something that we choose to give the data and get the free services. You are, <laughs> you are thinking a bit ahead of time. This is exactly... Uh, the point. I don't want to reveal because I want this to be a bit of a secret because I want to do some additional research. But this is exactly, if I got the, correct, if I got the question correct, what I want to create. They still can have the data if I voluntarily let them to have some kind of subscription to it. And at a certain point, I can 
you know, revoke it and delete it because I just want to. And do not, you know, go through the website with a 50th tab or 50th sub tab to have this ability, which again I don't trust. So anyway, it's a, it's a good way of thinking. Just wait, wait a bit, wait a bit. It's gonna be, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Hi, Chair. Uh, one one questions uh, here. No, I yeah, I just okay. waiting for the sign. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you addressed security in a matter like someone hacking your chip. But what if uh, your chip is connected to a lot of services, like you said, uh, to subway uh, tickets or whatever? What if some people hack the other systems, uh, keeping you out of them? Like you cannot enter the subway anymore because you've been hacked of their system or something like that. All the other uh, companies that would access your chip may be your data erased from their database or something like that. It's again a very good high tech question, which I appreciate. I hope I'm going to try to answer it as simple as I can for the wider audience. So, um, um, let me share you a story. I'm a member of Facebook from, I was among the first 50,000 people in there, so long, long ago. So, a lot of services I use, they are out, like login via Facebook button. And last year, somewhere in September, Facebook banned me. So I put a very successful blog post. I had a huge spike of traffic. And they said, we want to have your real name. And unless you provide us the passport, we are uh, blocking your account. I said, my first reaction would be, screw you. I'm never giving you a passport. But I, I was kind of forced to do that. Because at a certain point, I realized that 80% of internet services I was using were authenticated using this button. So where I'm leading to is I want this experience made me think I have to change that. So I want this chip to first of all be owned by the person. So basically you know, nobody can ban you. This is what I'm saying. Nobody can uh, ban your account, like, uh, call your account or whatever. So it's already kind of a solution. In terms of uh, uh, how do you make sure that they don't hack you and replace you or whatever, it's going to be pretty complex because I believe that the only way it's going to work if the uh, identification in the chip is changing every five, 10 seconds on the go, literally. So basically, is those of you who use uh, Battle.net account, uh, basically, you know what? OTP, OTP, OTP is one of the illustrations. So I believe that if the chip is generating new passwords every seconds or whatever, and the bank knows how to connect, and it's used only for this. So for example, when I'm coming home, it's different set of keys. And it's, it's never the same every second. So I believe that it's going to be freaking hard to hack. And I don't want to go into too much technical details, but I believe that the storage and the attitude to deal with the data, it should be multi-layered. Like you have your brain. And there are different types of memory. The things you remember right now, the things you think you remember from a week ago, and the thing from your childhood, you remember when you're standing in the shower for no reason at all, you say, oh, I was so stupid. Why did that? So this is how the brain works. And I believe that it can be copied. We have, listen, we have to listen to the nature and basically try to find a way to do the same with the data storage. So to have data that is available right now, that is basically relevant only to banks, that is relevant only to Google, that is relevant. So it shouldn't be full access to all information to everyone. No way. We have to be very segmented, very targeted, and very well managed automatically. So basically, I believe that artificial intelligence, if it's done properly, it can help. Because artificial intelligence would always be stupid. It's not emotionally rich as us. But they're very good into no emotional decision. So this, this IP cannot access this because, because of that. Or I, like I, as a user, I say, do not let uh, anyone anyone from Japan to my account. I just don't want to. For no reason, because I want to. This is how it's supposed to work. I hope this is the answer. Cool. Last one. Question. Last question, guys. We are a bit of out of time. Okay. Go. Uh, I got your, uh, your question. You made it per uh, personal. So you're leaving the fear of having your data exposed every day. And actually, it's fears you because it achieves you in as a uh, human being so my question is uh, okay you made you made us think 
how are we going to solve the problem with the um, sharing your data non scripturally for uh, everyone use what they want but if we uh, i think if we, we cannot give it to a company to take care of it because they will happen they will use that by their by their own uh, doesn't matter if you have a button to click and shut it off they will use and as a contract as you said it's a way but uh, you was telling him about controlling like an IP, I would think it would be uh, the way to solve that would be not only in a level of storage data, but how information communicate and spread between the uh, inside the internet. So, as you said. So, uh, basically, asking the question and you answer it. No, no <laughs> sorry, sorry. I belong <laughs> too much. No, no, uh, sorry. No, do you, uh, are are you and your company working on this right now? And are you uh, able to share with us o o on something? what? On ways of distributing data? The, the avoid data or control your own data. Yes, we, this is the whole point. Yeah, we're thinking about it because there are many ways, unconventional ways to uh, encrypt data and store it in a way that nobody can have access to. You use torrents. Well, anyway, so, so you you thinking on encryption as a solution? No, encryption is by design everywhere. Uh, solution is very complex, but let me just throw something in your mind. Maybe it would explain what, how I think. We have torrents, so P2P, um, instead of storage in the centralized place, and you have BitChain technology that Bitcoins use. If you apply the the right t way of thinking and expertise that we have. You can theoretically store data everywhere and nowhere. Nobody knows where it is. So gotcha. not a single company, only you know. And you can assemble it when you apply biometrics, password, chip, whatever. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I have to. You're a magnificent crowd. Happy to be here. Go Brazil.